This video is on objectivity or sometimes called realism. We're talking about realism in the context of metaphysics or objectivity. In any case, we're talking about Peter Van Inwagen's take on this topic in his book, Metaphysics. And clearly this is against anti-realism. And this is part one, of course. So what Van Inwagen does is he starts with what he calls the common Western metaphysic. And these are sets of beliefs that are very common among those who live in the Western cultures. And it is true also of analytic metaphysicians that we pretty much share this common Western metaphysic. And so certain aspects of that are relevant to the topic of objectivity or realism. And so two of them here are especially relevant. Our common Western metaphysic claims that our beliefs and assertions are either true or false. So beliefs represent the world as being a certain way. So statements that we make about our beliefs mean that the world is a certain way. And of course, they're true if the world is that way, they're false if the world is not. So if we assert that blue whales are the largest living animals, that's true if and only if blue whales are the largest living animals. And it is true. So another claim is the world exists and has the features it does in large part independently of our beliefs and assertions. And so the way the universe is depends very little on humans. And so we'll qualify these in a couple ways. So one is to consider uh, what objectivity does mean or does not mean. So it, it doesn't mean that if you affirm objectivity that that puts you up as the ultimate judge, right? It doesn't mean that you or anyone else is claiming to be the judge of everything that is true. So objectivity does not imply that at all. It's not part of the view of objectivity. Now, going back to those first two claims that we just made, a couple qualifications. So the first uh, claim about our beliefs and assertions being either true or false, sometimes there are beliefs or claims that are made that are meaningless. And so if something's meaningless, it's not the kind of thing that's true or false. And here is a quote from a book by John Haught. I believe that's how his name is pronounced. And he says, the Taoist intuition is that nature is informationally shaped by the non-interfering effectiveness of ultimate reality. Now to me, I don't understand that sentence because I simply, it, it doesn't have any meaning to me. I, I can't put it together in a way that makes any sense. And of course, if somebody challenges him and says something like this, his response is that I am compelled to resist the invitation to clarify, for to clarify something is to situate it in the metaphysics of the past. Well, call me one who's stuck in the metaphysics of the past, I guess, because I expect statements to both have meaning, and then you can evaluate whether or not they are true. Okay, so meaningless statements obviously are not going to fit into that first claim. And then uh, some assertions might lack a truth value. They may not be true or false due to vagueness. So if we say something like, Steve is old, well, old is a vague term, and sometimes it varies according to context, but even in the same context, it's sometimes uh, not really clear what it's supposed to mean. If you say that Dave is tall, well, you know, that's a vague term. Exactly how tall do you have to be in order to be tall? There's just no clear cutoff there. And so maybe if you say someone is tall, um, that sentence may not have a truth value because of that vague term. Now, most of our beliefs and assertions are not going to be limited by these two qualifications. And I should add on that, that concern about vague terms, 
even when we use vague terms, and there are a lot of vague terms in our language, but even if we say, uh, use these vague terms, we might say something like, Jimmy Carter is old. Well, it doesn't matter what your standard of old is, that would be a true statement. And the problem with that illustration, of course, is that some of you may be watching this after Jimmy Carter has already passed, but you know that's the risk you take when you're identifying someone as old. Another example might be Shaquille O'Neal is tall. Now that statement is true. It's just simply true that Shaquille O'Neal is tall. Even though tall is a vague term, we have these cases where we can have sentences that are certainly true and use these vague terms. So most of our beliefs assertions aren't limited by the qualifications. Okay, what about that, that second claim, the claim that the world Ha exists and has the features it does in large part independently of our beliefs and what we say about it. Um, the features of the world, of course, do actually include our beliefs and assertions. So there is uh, one level of dependency there, right? The features of our world are not entirely independent of our beliefs and assertions because of this. So for example, whether a particular statue is admired by many people is a feature of the world that is determined by what people think. If there are many people who believe that the statue is admirable, then that's a feature of the world, right? So it would still be the case though that this statue is admired by many people. That's going to be true if and only if it's a fact that the statue is admired by many people. If it's not, then the statement is false. So it, it, this isn't really a hindrance on uh, the problem here. And most of the features of our world, of course, are not dependent on our minds, and most of them are not limited in this way. Right? Most of the universe is unrelated to what people think and believe. Now, another thing that I hesitate to mention here, but there's this phrase that I sometimes hear from people, well, that's true for you, but it's not true for me, or something to that effect. Objectivity or realism implies that there's no such thing as something being true for you and not true for me. That just doesn't make any sense. Instead, this is kind of a misleading way of stating that there's a disagreement about what people think. So when you disagree with somebody, you may say, this is what I claim is true. This is what, that's different from what you claim is true. But that doesn't mean that it actually is true for you or it actually is not true for the other person. Um, sometimes this phrase might be used to express uh, preferences, you know, so somebody prefers chocolate and says that chocolate's the best ice cream and another person prefers vanilla. And so, well, it might be true for you that chocolate's the best ice cream, but it's not true for me. Obviously, this is just a distinction about preferences. This isn't a problem at all for objectivity. Here's a, a direct quote from Van Inwagen. And he says, the most interesting thing about objective truth is that there are people who deny that it exists. This obviously illustrates his firm commitment to objectivity. And he does find it certainly just odd that people are going to deny what we've just described. Now, let's be clear about this. To deny objectivity is not um, idealism. So idealism is an epistemological claim, not a metaphysical claim, more so. It, it certainly involves metaphysics, but it's what's going on when we have beliefs. So let's take it as a metaphysical claim. What it says is there aren't any mind-independent things. There's no physical stuff. And so everything that exists is either a mind or the modification of minds. Okay, that part of idealism is very uh, metaphysical in its claim. But notice 
even within idealism, the way things are really doesn't depend on our minds. In other words, it's not up to me or anyone else to determine how the world is. So according to an idealist, there are elephants. It's just that elephants are things perceived and only exist in minds. Well, it would, it's still true that there are elephants, and it's not really up to us whether there are elephants or not. And so the world contains the, object it, the objects that it has independently of any particular person, any, independently of any given community. Now, maybe you might say it's dependent on God, that's what Barclay ultimately said, but it's certainly not dependent on us and human minds. Okay, so what is the contrary view? The reason I've sometimes called objectivity realism is because the contrary view is best identified as anti-realism. And anti-realism claims that the individual activity of one's mind, or in some cases, it might claim the collective activity of a group of people's minds, determine the general nature of reality. And of course, that would imply that objectivity is false. Now, this is a view taken by philosophers. This is a view taken by uh, some philosophical ideas that we've primarily most for the most part exported into other disciplines so uh, among philosophers it's sometimes the view taken by pragmatists and in the tradition of american pragmatism this is a view uh, that anti-realism is a view that fits in with a lot of american pragmatists and more recently one of the most famous ones hillary putnam um, it also fits in with many uh, postmodern theorists, and uh, so this is a view that many postmodern theorists uh, have and adopt and claim, and that's uh, one of the views that we've, for the most part, exported from philosophy, but it's thriving in English departments. So, in any case, anti-realism says that what the world is and how the world is is dependent on a community of inquirers or maybe dependent on an individual person okay so how is this going to work let's just take something that people would normally agree is a fact we'll call this f mount everest is 8849.9 meters high and we're talking about now, not 2,000 years ago or 50,000 years ago. Now, ob objectively, is this an objectively true fact about the world? The proponent of objectivism, such as Van Inwagen, says yes. The anti-realist says no. This is something, because everything is this way, it, it's something that is dependent on us and our mind. Now, the realist view on this is that the processes that formed the mountain occurred independently of humans, right? In geological time, that's how the mountain was formed long before humans were around. Our minds had nothing to do with the resulting height of the mountains. And so this was a fact prior to the existence of humans. So it, it couldn't possibly be dependent on human minds, right? If that's the case, there weren't even humans around when the mountain was formed. So it seems right to say that F is true, and that is true independently of any particular people, any communities of inquirers, and independently of humanity as a whole, for that matter. Okay, so what would an anti-realist have to say about this? An anti-realist response would have to be that mountains in height are social constructs, like everything else. So it's a social convention to designate the base of a mountain wherever that might be convenient. 
and to use the sea level as a starting point, for example, for measuring the height of a mountain. Other beings, other creatures besides humans might have other interests, and they could have done these things differently. Uh, the result then would be that Mount Everest would not be 8,849.9 meters high. Because of their different interests, they would, it would be a different height. Okay, that seems to be the anti-realist response here. Well, here's how Van Inwagen responds to this idea that things are matters of social constructs. He says, okay, fine. Certainly, we, it could, it's true that we could have designated mountains differently. We, we could have decided to measure mountains at the tree line. Um, and if we did that, then the words used in F would express something that's false. But F, the proposition, would still be true. Now notice here, this is a very important distinction, that there's a difference here between the sentence and the proposition that it expresses. And what Van Inwagen is saying, well, sure, that particular sentence could have expressed a different proposition, but the proposition that is actually expressed by that sentence is true, right? So to say Mount Everest is 8,849.9 meters high, that's what F is, right? That's our sentence, is to say that an object X has that height. And even if we would have used Mount Everest differently, maybe to refer to some other object Y, right? That doesn't start at sea level, some other place. The object X, the one that was actually referred to in that sentence would remain the same height. So the same is true then of the other characters, the other words used in that sentence. So meters could have meant something different. We could have used different numerals there and same set of numerals maybe, but have them represent different things. So what we now uh, use to symbolize eight could be what looks like a four for what we now use. All right, so sure we could have used that sentence to represent a different proposition. That's Van Inwagen's response. So here overall, we have the criticism of this social construction argument. And the social con construction argument about mountains and height, that is perfectly consistent with F being objectively true. True if in fact the world is that way. And it's perfectly consistent with the general truth of realism. So this argument actually doesn't do any damage to objectivity. And we might compare this. Consider this sentence. One plus one equals two. Okay. It's not a socially constructed claim. Now, sure, we could have used different words and symbols, right? So we could have had a language that when we say, one plus one equals two. Um, well, we, we could have met, uh, sorry, let's start again. We could have had a language where we put, we exchange the plus sign and the equal sign. So we would say one equals one plus two. All right, one equals one plus two. And that could have meant what we now mean when we say one plus one equals two. And in that case, right, that new sentence that I suggested, one equals one plus two, would be true because the plus and the equals mean the opposite things that they do now, right? And so that's why uh, it really doesn't matter, right? So when we now mean, when we say one plus one equals two is true, regardless of how our language turned out. The proposition that it expresses is true. It doesn't matter how we use terms. And so what we now mean when we say Mount Everest is 8,849.9 meters high, that is true regardless of how our language could have expressed it. So that's Van Inwagen's response 
to the social construction argument, which does seem to be a common argument against objectivity. Well, this seems a little bit odd. So we do need to allow the anti-realists to maybe propose something else and push this dialogue a little farther. So that's what we're going to do when we go into part two.